people that she sees to. Lord, she does what the Bible says, go out in the world and preach the gospel. And Jesus always preached to the lowest and the vulnerable. So we just thank you for Claire and just pray your blessing upon her now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The reading will be done shortly. Okay. Am I switched on? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, good morning everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here to represent Azalea. I know quite a lot of you know quite a lot about Azalea. Um, but we've changed quite a bit recently, so there's some new stuff to add to the Azalea story, which I'd like to share with you. And I um, also would like to share with you a Bible passage that um, God showed me that's very relevant to the work that um, we are doing and moving on to do at Azalea. So my name's Claire, and I'm the Director of Women's Services at Azalea. So what that means is that I oversee all the work that is done, all the frontline work that is done with the women. So that includes our outreach, our drop-in, our exit and intervention work, where we do practical stuff with the women, and our new recovery centre. So I've been working with women um, who have exploited for 28 years uh, in various places around the country, um, in London, lots of the big cities, lots of the big cities up north. Um, which is quite strange, really, because I always wanted to be an English teacher. So I don't quite know how that has happened. I'd, so it's definitely a God thing that, that, um, that that's happened. And, um, yeah, I just feel I've been working in Luton for 17 years. So the women that work out on the streets in Luton, I've known many of them for 17 um, for 17 years, and I've been involved with Azalea right from when it started. And I actually remember I was working in statutory services, working in local drug services, uh, doing a lot. And I was brought in from London to actually set up services in Luton for women that were out sex working in the streets. And when I used to work around, I was a Christian, and I was what I call an undercover Christian, because I don't know if any of you have worked in the public sector, but to say you're a Christian is a no-no. You cannot do that. But obviously, you learn ways to, um, especially when you're outreaching with women, you learn ways to what music you're playing in the car. Oh, it's Christian music. Bible text down, and they pick them up and say, oh, what's this? So you learn ways to uh, be in what I called an undercover um, Christian. So I was working for statutory services, and one day I got a phone call, and a lady who was called Ruth Robb, who I'm sure many of you know is the chief executive of, of Azalea, to say, oh, a group of people from some local churches have got together, and we want to um, do a Christian-based organization working with the women. I was like, wow, God answers prayer. I had been praying for the women's spiritual needs to be met. And there was Ruth. So Ruth came out with me on outreach. And as um, I introduced her to the women that we were working with, so my journey with Azalea started then. So I, as, as Azalea progressed, I never actually went to work there. I stayed working in the statutory sector. And sometimes I used to say to God, why aren't I working at Azalea? It's everything. I'm passionate about God. I'm passionate about the women, and I'm passionate about that. Why am I not working in Azalea? Why am I working in the statutory services? But it never, just never happened. When, as I look back on my journey, I can really see that it was me being, God placed me where I was in the statutory services to embed Azalea in Luton and embed in Zalia into the statutory services. And when I did come over 18 months ago, which I'll go on to explain how that's happened, it was just the right time. It was God's timing. So I think that is like living proof that it is God's timing, and it works the, the right way. So um, I'm sure you all know that Azalea is a prayer ministry. We are first and foremost a prayer ministry. And what I mean by that is we don't do what we do and then pray about it. We pray about it and then we do it. We are such a spirit-led organization. It's such a privilege to be working in that environment where we pray and we get led by God. It is just amazing. And it's actually, we actually work in the miraculous daily in Azalea. I could give you many, many examples of the miraculous that we see in Azalea. Just recently, we had um, a woman that we hadn't seen for a long time, and I was really, really concerned about her. 
And I knew that the man that she was around was very exploitative and very dangerous. So it was a very real concern about this woman. Um, our staff team, we every morning when we start work, we come in and we pray together in the morning about our day. And um, we prayed for this woman. We said, you know, we, we really need to see her. We were, God, we really need to see this woman. We need to work with her. We know how much you love her. We know how much you don't want her out there. This was on the Monday, first thing on a Monday morning. On our Wednesday afternoon drop-in, I happened to be down in drop-in. And I'm not very often in drop-in in the day because I'm doing other things up in recovery. And the doorbell was buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And this woman who we were praying about is very loud. Very, very loud. The door was buzzing. We let open the door. This woman came flying in. She went, Claire, oh my goodness. Monday night, I was dreaming and you were calling me to come into Azalea. And now I'm here. I mean, what else can you explain? But that is God's. That is God's. That, that woman came. And we managed to start to do... That day was the beginning of starting to do some work with her and um, getting, her, getting her housing sorted out and actually her moving away from this man that she was with. So, and that is the sort of thing that we see every day in Azalea. And I think it's one of the, um, in the amazing worship that we've just had, one of the songs, it was saying that, you know, the, the more that someone's in darkness, the more that God can show their love. And these women, they are in so much darkness that we are so privileged to see when God shines a light into their lives. And it is amazing the things, that, the things that happen. So, um, yeah, and also we're a volunteer-led organization. And the reason for that is not because we're a saving money organization. It is the fact that these women, everything they do, everything they do in their life throughout their exploitation is someone does something for them because they have to do something back. And having volunteers who love and walk alongside our women it shows the women that there is people that will do something and they don't want something back. Life is not all about exchange, that people can love you. And that is a real way, a real expression of how God loves us and God shows us grace and God shows us mercy in the same way. So using having volunteers at Azalea is a way, a real way to show the women God's love in a real, real, real physical way. Um, so, yes, yeah, so again, I want to thank you for coming here. So, um, when I came in here, it was, the sun was shining and it was a lovely day. And do you know what? I just thought this, this church feels so welcoming. It really does. Everything about this church and its church feels um, really welcoming. So, I do have a few connections with this church, one of them uh, being Vicki Miller and the lovely Julia. <laughs> So I worked with Vicky at Azalea, and um, I had the I was the privilege of sharing an office with Vicky, which was great. Which was great. I, I miss Vicky so much, and it was great because I'm not good at IT. And I was just saying earlier, I'd be quite happy still to be using a typewriter. But there you go, life's moved on. So Vicky was just behind me. So if ever I needed anything, I could just turn around and ask Vicky. So I really miss her for that. But one thing I don't miss Vicky for is she was so untidy. She was so untidy. And I am, I am a declutterer. I don't have clutter. Vicky, if any of you have ever given Vicky a Bible text, I'm telling you, it was on our wall in our office. If Vicky went anywhere and she got some sort of um, token or memento or anything from a church thing, it was on her desk. Not in a drawer, it was on her desk photographs, everything. It was like wading through everything. So when Vicky, the day that Vicky cleared out her office, I was devastated of Vicky leaving. And I mean, I understand why she went. And she's moved on to Pastors New and it was the right thing for her. But it's very difficult when someone leaves your life who you've worked so closely in such difficult situations with. But I loved it when she took those boxes. It felt like a burden was lifting. <laughs> Oh, now you've got them, Julia. <laughs> so uh, also, someone else I know from this church is um, Joy Graham, Joy and Calvin. So they used to come to a church that I used to, a previous church that way they went to was a previous church that I went to. So I was thinking, oh, I love Joy and Calvin so much. They are such rocks. They've been rocks in my life. They've been mentors to me in the past. So I actually love Joy and Calvin. Um, 
One of the things with joy is, though, I was thinking, hmm, I'm not just going to do this about Vicky, I'll do this about joy as well. I went to a women's weekend up in Bradford, organised by Life Church with joy, and ended up sharing, there was three of us, ended up sharing a room, a hotel room. So uh, um, it was joy, myself, and another friend. But joy made it quite clear to us, that if we were going to share a room with her, she needed her sleep. So we had to be quiet. We weren't allowed to be noisy in the night. And yeah, she did her sleep. So, um, yeah, we said, yeah, that's fine, Joy, that's fine. Now, and I'm sure the women here know that when women go to a women's conference and there's no men and there's no children, we get quite excited. <laughs> and we really like to have a good time. So we were having a great time at this women's conference in uh, Bradford, and we went back to the hotel room. I would just like to say, although we made up the hat of what happens in Bradford stays in Bradford, Joy was still up talking at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> Joy was still up talking at two o'clock in the morning, and we were trying to go to sleep. So that's how that's how it was with Joy. So I love her dearly, but she does she did like to talk late at night. So uh, yeah. So then I so as I said, I moved over to Azalea, um, and uh, one of the uh, great things about working at Azalea is that I got to cut my hours. So I've been a full time working mum for 26 years. And I got to take Fridays off. So it was absolutely, it was part of my new contract, working 30 hours. So I had Fridays off. So I was determined that Fridays were going to be for me, were going to be my me time. So I was, but I've forgotten what I actually like doing because I haven't had time to do anything for so many years. And somebody in my church runs a Pilates class. So I thought, great, Friday mornings, don't have to go to work, I'm going to do Pilates. And um, so I went to the Pilates class. Her name's Caroline, the lady that runs this Pilates class. And we've, she was absolutely amazing. This Pilates, she just loves Pilates. She knows so much about it. She's an amazing Pilates teacher. And I have to admit, I've got a major girl crush on her. I wanted to be her. I'm a bit like that with worship team. God's made put my pathway what it is, but there's a big bit of me I'd love to be on the worship team. <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't get that voice. Um, uh, so my Pilates teacher, I got a huge crush on her. I was like, I want to be her. She's so calm. And she just like does, stands at the front. And she knows so much about it. Um, but then one day, I was doing the Pilates class. And I realized that my crush had gone too far. When I was thinking, I wonder if I'd be able to have my hair like hers. <laughs> And I drove home, and I thought, no, this is not good. This is not good. I've gone too far. But when I was driving home, it reminded me of something that happened, a Bible text in my past about David. Now, I'm pretty sure you all know who David is, and he wrote the Psalms and stuff. And I remembered reading. I was quite young, um, and I remember reading in Acts 13, 22. It says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Well, I was a new Christian then, and it was a bit of the same thing. I was like, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be that. I want to be someone that is known as a woman after God's own heart. But I wasn't quite looking at it in the right way. I wanted to be God's favorite. I really wanted to be God's favorite. And when I'm in my Pilates class and the teacher's looking around, I'm a bit like, yeah, say I'm good, say I'm good. <laughs> it makes my day if she says I'm good. Oh, that's a good position, Claire. It makes my day. I really wanted to be like that with God. And um, so I was sort of doing things to make God like me more or be, become God's um, favorite. Uh, obviously, I've moved on in my journey now, and I know that God completely loves me now, whatever I do or don't do. And I cannot do anything to earn his love. And he will never love me more than he does now because he completely loves me. But during that time, I kept praying. I kept praying, God, God, you know, I want to, uh, I want to be known as a woman after God's own heart. I want to be known as that woman. And as God does when we pray like that, even if we don't understand, God granted me that answer to that prayer and he did make me a woman after his own heart because he gave me eyes for women who are exploited. And he made me see them how he saw them. So he did give me his heart. And he made me see that these women, he had a plan for all of these women 
and that was not where they are now. That he did not, his plan for them was be to be living full, abundant lives, not to be mistreated, not to be beaten up, not to be raped, not to be running the streets, not to have men controlling them, not to be able to have a thought of their own in their own head. He did not want that for those women. And God opened my eyes to seeing that. So God did make me a woman after his own heart in seeing things how he sees them. And it now, all these years later, when I'm driving through Luton or when I'm in any town, because my eyes are opened, I can go to any town and I can see where exploited women are. I get angry and upset when I see a woman out there on the streets. Why is that woman out there? Why is, why is that being allowed to happen in this town? And um, yeah, but what God gave me as well was, the, was to be involved in changing that and being a part of those women's lives and walking along in that journey. So one of the things I will say about that is be careful what you pray for. <laughs> because I still, there's a little bit of me that does want to be an English teacher. Because I don't want to be out in the middle of the night <laughs> going around and driving around and things like that. So... But after that little journey I had with God, I really um, started to look at David. I really started to study David in the Bible. And I absolutely loved him. And the reason that I loved him was because he has done everything. He's done everything. There's nothing that we could do. There's nothing that we could do that he hasn't already done. There's jealousy. He had affairs. He did this. He did that. So there's nothing that he has done that we could possibly do that David hasn't done. And what I loved about David throughout all that time, he's so stable in God, and he was so stable in prayer. And the things that he did, the impact they had on them, he didn't blame God. If he made a choice to do something, he put that right with God, and he repented. And I absolutely, I absolutely loved, I just absolutely um, loved David's, journey and I, I've you know used that so much in my own journey. So going back to Azalea, a few uh, I think it was about three years ago that um, Azalea was going really well. They were doing a lot of crisis work with the women. The drop-in was going well. Um, they had Vicky on board who was doing a lot of work with the women, individual work for the women. But Ruth Robb, our chief exec, is a visionary. So nothing stays still in Azalea ever. She is a visionary and her vision was that, yeah, Azalea was doing well with the crisis work with the women. We were looking after them. We were feeding them. We were keeping them alive. But she wanted to move on, and she wanted to do recovery. She wanted those women to not be in that situation, to not be in that life, and it needed to change. So Ruth asked me if I would consider coming over to Azalea and using all my um, years of experience in working with these women to run a recovery centre. I said, Ruth, I need to pray about this. I really need to pray about this. But it felt right, and I felt really excited. Um, I felt that I would be able to bring everything together. I would be able to be open about my faith. Because one of the things that I have seen throughout all the areas and all the places that I've worked, one of the things I've seen is that these women need God. And we're not looking for them not to use drugs or them not to, use sex, not to be sex working, for them not to be in a... We're looking for complete transformation of their lives. And I have seen time and time again that without God, that complete transformation just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. So I felt really, really excited. And one of the things, so I went away to pray um, about this, where I was going to be in this, where Azalea was going to go with this. And I started thinking about David again, as I always did around things in my life. And I thought, yeah, David... You haven't run a recovery centre, have you? Where do I look for this? You haven't run a, run a recovery centre. And God being God, a few weeks later, brought a Bible passage to me. And I'm just hoping that um, someone's going to come up and read the Bible passage for me now. And this is uh, it's 1 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 5.
Because it's rather a weird passage. Ah, mm. oh, maybe I could read it in passage. I suspect. I can read anyway. Where is it? Yeah. So you could have the passage now. This bit here? Yeah. Not that. Sorry, what's in between? Yeah. You're going to do something now. Okay, I'll look through it. No, I'll do. <laughs> we, should have we should have checked this, shouldn't we? Well, I looked at the Bible manual, mm. and that seemed a bit more relevant somehow. I'll try. Yeah. And then what? Yeah. That, and then that. Yeah, and then read We're going to have a break there. Yeah, can you, you read that, and then you can read that. Uh, 1 Samuel, it's exactly where we're not quite sure. Um, David, therefore, departed from there and escaped to the cave of Abdullah. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress... Okay, sorry, can't read that. <laughs> everyone who was in distress... In and who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him so he became captain over them here them there were about 400 men with him sorry I didn't do very well either oh, that's fine. That's my fault. Sorry. okay yeah, I'll find it later yeah. am I back on now yes yeah, sorry about that so um, in this chapter, so when I read this, that um, David, at this point, David was hiding from Saul because um, at that point, he, uh, God had anointed him to be king, but he had not been appointed as king and he needed to hide from Saul and he went to this cave. And when he went to this cave, oh, everybody went with him and where it says um, everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented and everyone who was in distress gathered to him. That's a Sorry? Oh, is it 22? Oh, sorry. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so it's 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 to 5. Um, yeah, so all these people, he actually had a recovery. David had a recovery center in a cave. All these people came to him. And... Um, when they, came, when they came to him, what they came to him for is because they were coming to him for hope, hope that things were going to change. And um, the, the name of the cave, which was called Adullam, which means justice of the people and retreat. Uh, so, again, God was showing me that David did run a recovery center alongside with everything else that he did. And also, these people that came to him, there was 400 people that came to him. He actually transformed their lives, and he looked after them, and he made them into an army. And why this is so relevant to the recovery center as Azalea is that's what we want to do with these women, because we don't just want them to be healed and transformed. We want them to be an army for God. We want them to be women that will reach other women. We want them to be women that will be standing up and rooted in God and bringing other people to God. And that is the aim of our recovery center at Azalea. And uh, 
throughout, throughout this passage, one of the things that really, really struck me was that David was in distress himself. So David was in a time when he needed support and he needed help. But what did God do? He brought all those 400 people for him to support. And, you know, it just made me think that in our faith journey, that um, when, we need, when we need support, what God often does is send someone or some people, or something to do for us to support. And while we are walking alongside other people, God then recovers us. And that becomes our recovery journey. And our cave, like the cave that David was in, becomes someone else's deliverance. So I think, and when, and again, relating this back to Azalea, that... um, all the volunteers that come to Azalea, what they will tell you is that it is actually life-changing and transforming for them to walk alongside these women, to, to see God's work so physically in action. Any of the volunteers that do anything for Azalea have say that it's almost more transforming for them than it is for the women. So that is just, and I just, you know, we just all feel so privileged to be um, to be there. And I think that when you're in a situation where things are going wrong for you, and you and you then turn around and support other people or do other things, you can't explain why it is the right thing to do. It is just the right thing to do. If your friends that aren't Christians won't understand because we live in a world that's very selfish and very self-centered, and a lot of the um, well-being and health stuff is about me, 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 and actually going out in a faith way and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm suffering and I'm hurt and I've been through a bad time and life's been difficult, and then going out to help someone else isn't how the world, the world operates. It isn't how the world operates. But that is proper kingdom living. That is proper kingdom living when you go out, when you give, for your healing. And that is just such a ethos behind our recovery center in Azalea. So what I wanted to do now is that I've got a short film, and you will recognize someone in the film. <laughs> so uh, we've got a short film just to show you what we're doing at Azalea now. And then after that, I'll talk about um, volunteering at Azalea and then a little bit about our new ministry, men's ministry, Flint. Yeah, so um, I'd just like to um, talk the next bit about uh, that woman's story in that um, one of our volunteers was at a um, Christian festival in the summer and someone came running up behind her, tapped on her back and said, it's me, it's me, and it was that woman. And she was actually there with her church that she's now with and she's working with the children and the teenagers in the church. And her life is totally transformed. So uh, that's just absolutely amazing. You know, and it just gives us all... There's hope in a dark world, that God has hope in a dark world. So, um, yeah, that gives you a flavour of what we're doing. But we've also got a new ministry that's now open in Azalea called Flint, where we are now going to work with the men that exploit the women. So this is a new thing for Azalea, and it's actually quite a new thing anywhere because we've been trying to find other um, organizations nationally that do the same thing, and actually we haven't found one. So it's a very innovative thing that we're doing. Um, It's quite different um, getting volunteers and raising funds for Flint because uh, sometimes people find it easier to see women as victims and the men who exploit the women is not looked at the same way. But my view is that we are all God's children, and these men are God's children too. And if you listen to some of their stories, they are very similar to the stories that the women have, that the women have as well. And their life has gone on to exploit women. The same as no child is born, and they are born to be in prostitution, No man is born to be an exploiter, and it's the same thing. So this is an ongoing journey in Azalea, and and all quite new. Um, Talking about volunteering at Azalea, um, sometimes people think that it's the frontline work that is the big thing at Azalea, which is extremely important, and it's about relationship building. But 
Azalea is so much more than that. We would not be able to run Azalea without the so many people that are behind the scenes. I always look at it like a band. Sometimes the singer is seen as the person in a band, but there's so much more to a band than that with the people that are playing the instruments. And it's very similar to that in Azalea because we wouldn't be able to, we'd have nowhere to run drop in if we didn't have the team of admin people that we have. So we have a we have a very small core group of people that are paying paid work for Azalea, but even our admin stuff is done by volunteers. So um, recording our... Uh, so um, any time a woman has any contact with Azalea, we need to have that... We legally need to have that recorded, and it is volunteers that do that. Um, we have um, our, our HR stuff and all our staff stuff is done by a volunteer. Everything in Azalea is done by volunteers, and I cannot stress enough how the frontline work would not be able to carry on without the structure behind it. Um, so we have hundreds of cake bakers, people that um, pray over the cakes, and um, we give out the cakes to the women. They're such an important part of our ministry. They are just as important as taking a woman over to house the council because they're about engaging women and showing love to the women. And we have um, volunteers that come in and clean our drop-in because we do we lo we want our drop-in to be a clean and welcoming place because the time the places that the women are normally they are not clean and they are not welcoming. They the women stay in crack houses. They live in squats. The place that we want Azalea to be totally different. Um, we have cupboards where people donate food that we. St um, give out to the women. We need people to clean the, uh, to sort out those cupboards because we constantly get donations in of clothes and stuff for the women as well. So there is so much more to volunteering than Azalea than, there in, than just doing frontline work. Because I know a lot of people think, oh, that isn't for me. I'm not called to work with these women. I don't feel like I've got the knowledge and the experience. Any, any knowledge, any skill, anything, any time we would be able to use Azalea. Um, because there's so much that um, needs to be done. So I just wanted to say, uh, but also, as I said, we're a prayer ministry. So one of the things that we, we really need, your prayers. So we have what's known as a prayer net. So you can go online. And if you put Azalea Luton in your computer, you can go online and you can register on our prayer net. Or you can, I've got some forms at the back that you're welcome to come in. And in our prayer net, oh, during the week, we put things in that need prayer. Now, an example of our prayer net, how well our prayer net works, is that one of the women came in and said, I'm going to, I think, I don't know why the council don't give um, out sleeping bags for the people that are rough sleeping. Now, people have different views on that, but this is what the woman said. She said, I think that um, I'm going to go to the council, I'm going to write the council a letter and say they should give sleeping bags out to people who are rough sleeping. And um, one of the volunteers was said, let's pray about it. So um, we, we sat there and we prayed about it, and the woman prayed about it. And Literally three days later, we got a phone call in the office from a lady in America who said, um, oh, I'd like to donate £5,000 to Azalea to buy sleeping bags for women that are rough sleeping. And I was, how do you know about Azalea? And she said, well, I don't know about Azalea, but someone else I know knows about Azalea. And she was telling me about Azalea on a plane. I was sitting next to her on a plane in America. She told me about Azalea. I was praying about it. And God said to me that I needed to give you money for sleeping bags. <laughs> so we've been able to hand out sleeping bags, which are a great tool of engagement with the women that we don't know that are out rough sleeping. We can offer them a sleeping bag. So, uh, And then this woman joined our prayer net. So... I mean, I cannot stress how much prayer is such an integral part of Azalea. We also, once every um, couple of months or so, we have a prayer evening where people come in and we pray for the women and we pray for things about Azalea. So, obviously, everybody would be really welcome at these prayer evenings and uh, joining our prayer net. And, yeah, we put things on there about certain needs that the women have. We give all the women pseudonyms so it's, we, we don't um, break any confidentiality around um, the women. Uh, if anybody's interested in any sort of volunteering, we're running a um, training course. So, we, 
we do a training course. Uh, this year it's going to be three sessions, three Saturdays uh, over about four or five months where you can really come and know what Azalea is and what we do and how we do it and look at where you, somebody, you, know, you might fit into um, working with Azalea. So uh, that's where Azalea is now. So we've got a very exciting year with um, Flint properly launching in a month. We've now got our recovery center. And um, that's, so the recovery center has been open for a year now. And um, the women are so damaged and they've had such difficult times. When I first started working in the recovery center and the recovery program that I've written, I thought this is going to be a long journey with the women, a really long journey. And I have to say, it is a very unusual recovery center because most recovery centers, you have to be abstinent to go to recovery center. Our recovery center is not abstinent in any way. The women can come because one of the things about exploitation is it takes away your ability to choose. And we need, how can you choose to go into recovery if you don't know how to choose? How can you choose to go into recovery if you can't remember what your new life is going to look like? So at the very beginning of our recovery is about decision-making and choosing. So uh, we're a very different recovery centre to many others. But I will say, so the recovery centre finished its first year. My view of, oh, it's going to be a very slow journey and the recovery is going to be, be very slow. God has completely different plans. And in the first year, we've got one woman who is now running her own Alpha course in her church. We've got another woman who's started attending college and is doing a college course. We've got another woman that's working in a... Um, a charity shop and absolutely loving it and has actually now just been promoted to a deputy manager in a charity shop. Um, we've got another woman who has um, been able to keep her baby and totally change her life around to be able to keep her baby. We've got another woman who was, who's been in recovery for the past year who uh, just before she came into the recovery her son was stabbed in the streets of Luton and he died and um, so we've walked alongside her in that journey. She is now going around all over the country speaking about knife crime. This is a year in our recovery centre, which just shows that God has no limits, and the things that we as humans put on, what we think God can do with the provisions he's given us, he just blows them away time after time after time. Um, so if you'd like to come and have a look around our lovely new three-storey building, which you saw in the... Um, Video. So we've got the drop-in downstairs, we've got a second level of the drop-in, and then we've got our recovery centre, so it's absolutely amazing. And we're right in the middle of town, and it's huge, although we already are already growing out of it. Um, every, if you go on our website, we have an open morning on a Friday morning every couple of months. You'd be quite welcome to come to that as well, to have a look round. So, um, but I'll be outside. I've got some leaflets and stuff outside and some forms. If you do want us to contact you because of with all the new legislation and data protection, we need to have a um, form signed for that. And if you want to ask me any questions. So, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you.